This film is brought to you by New York Life and its dedicated agents. Proud sponsors of the NFL's team highlight films. New York Life, the company you keep. In 1991, the Houston Oilers followed a familiar path to the playoffs and tried to maintain an even pace. It is a long season. It's kind of a marathon, but it's a sprint, too. Every week is a sprint. You've got to win that week. Houston had to prove its stamina. All you have to do is go out there and win them. If you go out and win those games, uh, you shut people up. The Oilers silenced all by striking it rich winning the AFC Central Division Championship outright for the first time ever. Houston is the only team in the NFL to qualify for the playoffs each of the past five seasons. And propelled by the league's best aerial attack, the Oilers unleashed a hurricane of passes in their postseason games against the Jets and Broncos. Flex, flex, flex. Hunt, hunt. Oilers changing the play at the line of scrimmage. Move. Fade pattern for Jeffrey, touchdown! Hayway Jeffrey's got the ball in front of Charles Dimery. And that oh, one was easy. Left. Look at the throwback right in the end zone, oh. touchdown! Gibbons deep in the end zone for Wide the score! Open. Wide open. In each contest, Houston scored early and often, making each game seem like it was going to be no contest. Boone is going to throw, looking outside for Duncan. He's got a touchdown! Toast! Oh, Toast. baby, what a Toast. throw! Back in the pocket, the pass. Yeah. Setting up down the oh, middle. Yeah. Give it yeah. touchdown! Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's the electric slide. Ernest Gibbons with his second touchdown catch of the game. And the oh, oh, yes. yeah. It was the Oiler defense that had to look out as both opponents tried to chip away Houston's lead. Even though the Oilers were feeling the heat, they kept their cool. O'Brien back to pass. Throws, ball is! It's Bubba McDowell, and they say he kept it for an interception. Oh, there's your big play. There's your big play. Against Denver, what had been the Oilers' year turned into John Elway's day. Denver escaped with a last second 26 to 24 victory. The Oilers could only wish that this playoff game had ended as their playoff game against the Jets ended. Where they spot the football. They're, They're now at least a foot short. Yeah. And Coslin says, go for it. Uh oh. Mark this play down in your book. Yeah, this could be really, really good for us. Or really bad. Burkett now in motion. Give the ball to McNeil. He dies. No. He's hit. No. The Oilers think they have held. And Tom White says, first down, Oilers. Twice, Houston stopped New York on fourth down. And on the game's final play, the Oiler defense sealed the win. I would say this is the final play of the game with one last chance. He throws it up and as far as he can. And there's nothing but blue shirts back there. And the Oilers have it in Orlando. It's McDowell. And the ball game is over. Houston won 17 to 10 in a game that typified the entire season. The roaring start, the sudden stop, and then victory. The Oilers struck it rich. Houston has a proud tradition of winning teams and premier players. While statues might someday be erected in their honor, when you're an Oiler, you're put on a pedestal. There. You don't mind everybody trying to take your spot. Uh, I said, awesome. no, that's the bomb himself. I'm just glad to see everyone here having a good time. At least you remember the old people. That's amazing. <laughs> Houston, Texas, can you can you find something like this? And believe me, this is a memorable time. This bunch back together was worth living 67 years to see. In July of 1991, one of the most exciting players in team history was given his just reward. Elected in his first year of eligibility, a big welcome for Earl Campbell. <laughs> The Tyler Rose has been officially designated as a Texas legend by the state. And Oiler fans made their feelings known when Earl Campbell was awarded his Hall of Fame ring.
In the season opener, the Oilers showed they were an ensemble of uncommon men, capable of the most extraordinary feats. At the six yard line, headed for the far side. And he will be brought down at the 19 yard line. Ball is loose, Oilers have it. Four turnovers were converted into four scores as Houston ran up the highest number of points scored in an opener in 30 years. In a high voltage offense, the power station is a line anchored by pro bowlers Bruce Matthews and Mike Munchak. Second down five, quick count. Moon back to pass. Throwing for Tony Jones, touchdown! Yeah. Raiders send four. Moon on a bootleg. Hey, Throwing over the middle, give it to the five, yeah. he scores! Yeah. Such a convincing victory bolstered the belief that this team was of championship caliber and that conviction would be put under fire a week later in Cincinnati. Houston had lost its last four games at Riverfront, and before history could repeat itself, the Oiler defense said, no more. Houston exposed the Bengals as a one-dimensional team, and then proceeded to destroy that dimension. The Oilers planned what would be the first of many pearls in a large collection of offensive jewels. Three receivers goes left, quick count, handed off to Pinkett, breaks yeah, it up in the hole. Cut. Inside the 30, 25, 20, 15 yeah. on his feet, 10, 5, touchdown, Alan Pinkett! Oh, baby, what a run! I feel like that's can adjust better the way the ball is thrown. Well, that's where he see, sees you there and he's trying to come underneath, so we'll just put it over. Three receivers near side. Moon, short drop. Looking for Jeffries on a fade pattern. Got it. Touchdown! Hey, with Jeffries! Having been cut and polished in the oiler mold, Houston unveiled a gem of a linebacker. All right. All right, Lamar, you'll have a seven audible. You'll be going on the back side, just like you always do right there. Zayas in the throw, looking for Brooks, looks off him now, down the middle, ball yeah. intercepted Lathan, midfield, 40-yard line, down to the near sideline, 30-yard line, 20-yard line, touchdown defense! Lamar Lathan helped give the Oilers their largest margin of victory ever at Riverfront Stadium. 2-0, baby! 2-0! The sky's the limit for this defensive uh, team, and, uh, you know, it's really scary because we really haven't reached our potential. Houston is planning for the years ahead. Quarterbacks and receivers are becoming so proficient at passing the football. It's going to be important. The teams that are going to have success defensively are going to be those that can rush the quarterback. The texture of the Oiler pass rush was clearly woven together by the power of two Pro Bowl linemen. Ray Childress unselfishly switched from end to tackle. He racked up seven sacks and earned the third Pro Bowl selection of his career. William Fuller was nicknamed the Fuller Rushman by virtue of his AFC best 15 quarterback sacks, the second highest number in team history. Fuller and Childress were just part of a unit that terminated the opposition's play. Sean Jones was second on the team with 10 quarterback sacks. Lee Williams was acquired in a trade and started when injury free. Doug Smith started the first 15 games at tackle, completing a defensive line that helped sack quarterbacks 45 times in 1991, fifth best in the league. Houston's success was in part a tribute to the communication that took place on the field. We have calls that make adjustments uh, to the fact that when the offense comes out, if they come out in the formation to where our particular defense called in the huddle doesn't fit, then we have to make adjustments and make calls on the field depending on what the offense comes out in or try to do to us. Al Smith directed the on-field adjustments that put linebackers Lamar Lathan and Johnny Meads into position to make the play. 
But of all Houston's linebackers, none filled the hole as many times as Smith. He led the team in tackles and was voted to the Pro Bowl. Smith displayed textbook perfect form, and on a Monday night, his teammates duplicated that technique. When punter Greg Montgomery bounced one high off the floor, Jeff Alm, Rick Graff, Scott Kozak, and Eugene Seal sprung into action. For the third week in a row, Houston never trailed. Boom, short drop, looking for Jeffries, got it, touchdown! Haywood Jeffries! Kansas City had one last shot to tie the game, but the Euler defense refused to crack. One setback, fake it the very word. DeBerg is gonna go for the home run. Looking deep, the ball is intercepted by Houston won 17 to seven, and for the first time in franchise history, started a season with three straight wins. After suffering a last second loss in week four, the Oilers used their bye week to devise new ways to score. In across the front, low snap, it bounces, Horan's yeah. blocked. The ball is loose at the goal line, the Oilers may have scored a touchdown. Bubba. Houston's first 28 points came from turnovers, which gave the offense all the time it needed. We're very, very patient. We take what the defense gives us. And when you got those two things running for you, you know, good things come your way. Hunt, hunt. Although Warren Moon may not have seen it, Ernest Gibbons stretched five catches into 151 yards to earn AFC Player of the Week honors. And then the AFC's Player of the Month stole the show. Shotgun, Elway, shuttle pass to Sewell, dragged down by William Fuller, ball comes loose, Fishman's got it in the end zone for a touchdown! Oh, oh my! Showtime! Chris Dishman knew his time would come. So I felt like coming into this year, a lot of teams was going to throw to my side. It was up to me to take my game to the next level and uh, prepare myself for that, and I think I prepared myself well. Dishman was so thorough in his preparation that for seven straight games, he caused a turnover. His six interceptions were second best in the NFL, and for the first time, he was named an All-Pro. Dishman emerged as the leader of a secondary that had their own recipe for success. Oiler defensive backs certainly walk their talk. Richard Johnson and Bubba McDowell stuff the short passes. Bo Orlando stalked the middle zones. The young guns, rookies Mike Dumas, Marcus Robertson, Steve Jackson, and Daryl Lewis batted balls towards experienced hands. Houston secondary possessed what it professed, a unit that covered all corners of the field. At five and one, the Oilers were basking in the sunshine of success, but in the Meadowlands, Houston faced a secondary that was overcast. All right, so, well, he'll do it, but I told Dave, he's got to be smart enough. But it's four Wait, two. it should be a direct right. call. I know that, I know that. But as soon as people do things uh, to get into these exotic coverages or double cover certain people, that's what frees up our, our, uh, our opportunity to run the football. Lorenzo White gave the Oilers the lead, but the Jets soon tied the score. You just have to get over on the sidelines and say to yourself, once we get down in plus territory, we've got to do some things to make uh, some plays to make points on the scoreboard. Dean Steinkuhler, John Flannery, Mike Munchak, Don Maggs, David Williams, 
Bruce Matthews, and Doug Dawson used timing and teamwork to provide solid protection, which allowed Moon to conduct an offense that reached soaring crescendos. Haywood Jeffries was the main instrument Moon called upon to orchestrate the offense into a symphony of triumph. Hey, Haywood having a great day, ain't he? Great job. Jeffries tied a club record with 13 catches, and in a 23 to 20 victory that seemed more musical than physical, the last note was perfect. Has time, over the middle, no. oh. That is Drew Hill, touchdown! Yeah. And there it is, catch number 411, the all-time leading receiver, and that's the way you want to get it, with a touchdown. <laughs> I broke the record on that one. You're all right, man. Right. 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 In 1991, Houston honored Drew Hill as its all-time leading receiver. He finished his career with the Oilers by catching a personal best 90 passes for over 1,100 yards. For the fourth straight season, Curtis Duncan didn't miss a game and finished fourth on the team with 55 catches. Ernest Gibbons is a mover and a shaker in the push and shove world of pro football. His body absorbs blows like foam rubber. And his 70 catches for 996 yards left defenders foaming at the mouth. For Gibbons always comes back to lead the last dance. Haywood Jeffries is a rising star who ascended to the top flight of NFL receiving in 1991. Me being a big frame out there that um, defensive backs falls in the run and shoot, they're not really used to send the big guys really running down the field like I can. And, uh, and it's always been a great asset for me to uh, adjust to the ball well. That's probably my best asset for as a receiver. In the best season of his five-year career, Jeffries became just the fifth player in league history to catch 100 passes. He was named All-Pro and gained over 1,000 yards for the second straight season. Jeffries, Givens, Duncan, and Hill. No quartet in NFL history caught more passes in one season than these Fab Four did in 1991. In Jim Eddy's second season as defensive coordinator, Houston improved to second in the AFC in takeaways. We really work on punching the ball out, stripping the ball, and uh, gang tackling you, and trying to take the ball away from you. Victories over the Dolphins and Bengals were highlighted by a defense that diffused both teams' explosive offenses with turnovers. Marino throws over the middle, ball is picked up by the rebound. Right. Darrell Lewis, 32, 20-yard line, 15-yard line, down the right line, touchdown! All right. <laughs> Look out, Sean Jones hits him as he throws, right. ball is picked off. Get up, get up. It is Lathan who's got the interception, his third of the year. With a big play right there. Sammy Smith hurdles, ball is loose again! The Oilers have the foot. Dishman's end zone recovery preserved a 17 to 13 victory in Miami. And against Cincinnati, Houston's defense allowed a season low 183 yards in a 35 to 3 win. With an 8 and 1 record, the Oilers were off to their best start in franchise history. They were a team united in the singular quest of a division title. And that journey would bring them to their knees in the weeks ahead. I'm going to say it again. In order to be the best, you got to beat the best. You got to beat the best. They've been there. In the season's 10th and 11th week, Houston played two of the best, the eventual Super Bowl champion, Washington Redskins, and the playoff-bound Dallas Cowboys. I think right now we're America's team, not Dallas. So take that for what it's worth. Back to back, they were, without question, the two best games of the season. Right tackle across the 40, 35. He's got 
Got a line drive kick going that Mitchell will take at the goal line. Up the middle of the field, breaking left. Ball is loose. There's a man scramble at the 24-yard line. The Oilers say they have the football. Houston made the plays to win in Washington, but a missed field goal led to a 16-13 overtime loss. The largest crowd in Oiler history witnessed a similar scenario against Dallas. Novacek in motion, far side. Emmett Smith with the run, trying to get outside on the right. Breaks the tackle, 20. Ball is loose! Ball is loose! The Oilers have it! The Oilers have it at the 14-yard line! And there's the big play by the defense! <laughs> Newly acquired kicker Al Del Greco would not waste this opportunity. Right hand, Benji, we got faith. Buckle your seatbelts. The kick is up, and it is good! <laughs> the Oilers have won it in overtime, 26 to 23. <laughs> With 29 seconds to go. Oh. Naturally, I'm sure there were a few doubts floating around, and, you know, here's another guy that, that can't make the big kick, and... Uh, even though I'd played seven years and made some in the past, it's not what you did in the past, it's what you've done for me lately. The Oilers signed up for their third fantastic finish in a row against the Browns. Trailing 24 to 21, Houston's defense forced Cleveland to punt. And with time running out in the fourth quarter, the Oilers struck it rich one more time. Heart. Moon is looking to throw in the end zone. Touchdown, Drew Hill! Nine seconds oh. to play. <laughs> Good night, Irene. Oh, what a football game. Three games to the wire had taken its toll. Houston lost two games in a row, and in week 15, a storm was gathering over the Astrodome. The final voltage in the Oilers' championship chase was switched on by their fans. You put our boys in the dome, and they're at home, and they'll go crazy. You watch them. This is the day to do it. You gotta have it. Run that rock, run that rock, baby. It's been a long career. That's what it's all about. It's what you work all those weeks for. Pink is the back. Moon is going to throw. Floats it toward the end zone. Jeffrey touchdown! Houston started the game with a bolt of offensive lightning, and the Oiler defense finished it with flashes of brilliance. O'Donnell to throw with loads of time. Heaves it down the field, and the ball is intercepted. by Orlando at the six-yard line. O'Donnell setting up tall in the pocket. Now throws down the middle, has a man. That is left. The ball is loose. And Orlando's made the recovery at the seven-yard line. Look out on the blitz. Lathan brings down O'Donnell. Ball is loose. Picked up Al Smith. He's loose in midfield. Al Smith is going to score a touchdown. Bring out the bubbly now. I think you faked the thing, Bob. Good night. Lamar lays it. He got right in O'Donnell's face and knocked the ball loose. The Houston Oilers are champions of the AFC Central Division with a 31-6 victory over the Pittsburgh Steelers. And there goes the banner.
The road to a championship often covers unfamiliar territory. And the Oilers showed they could conquer that terrain by winning on the road in Cleveland. In a season that saw Moon set league records for attempts and completions, no completion loomed larger than his two-yard touchdown pass to Jeffries, which put Houston ahead 17-14. But this game would come down to the final play, and this time, Lady Luck smiled upon the Oilers. In equaling a franchise best 11 and five regular season record, Houston had become a powerhouse, and the cornerstone was the coaching staff. In 1991, the Oilers had eight players, including six starters, voted to the Pro Bowl. No team had more. Houston Oilers, AFC Central Division Champions. Hi, I'm Steve Sable. For the last five years, the Oilers have qualified for postseason play, yet haven't advanced any further than the divisional playoff. In fact, they've won only three of their last eight postseason games. And for Warren Moon, time's running out. And last year's playoff loss in Denver could be one of his last chances to win a championship. However, as Moon's clock continues to tick down, Houston's run-and-shoot offense is winding up and setting records at a breakneck pace. At age 35, 1991 may have been Warren Moon's last shot at a Super Bowl. At the time, it was pretty devastating, but we still either talk about it or joke about it every now and then that we should have never let that game get away from us and we just hope that game somewhere down the line doesn't haunt us. While the Oilers have yet to win the big one, they escaped from what could have been their biggest loss. If Kevin Gilbride had gotten the Pittsburgh Steelers job, I don't know that Houston would have continued the run and shoot the way it had been running without Gilbride. In, in a sense, uh, Gilbride not taking that job, I think, really allowed the run and shoot to continue for another year. In the three seasons Gilbride's tutored Moon, the Oilers have fielded the NFL's top-rated passing offense. The emphasis, as opposed to most offenses, where you start with run, run, run to set up the pass, it's the exact reversal that uh, you, you pass, pass, pass. In 1991, it seemed all the Oilers ever did was pass. In an overtime victory against Dallas, Moon connected on 41 of 56 for over 400 yards, but didn't throw a single touchdown pass. Most people look at this offense as a big play offense, and all we're going to do is score points really quickly. Because of the way it's evolved, they're playing a lot of zone defense, which forces us to uh, throw a lot of shorter passes. I think generally I only usually get through two to three of the receivers uh, as far as my progression is concerned. The call guy on a route, the main receiver on a route, might have four to five options depending on what it is he wants to do. 
A signal alerts Moon to which option was chosen, but basically the rule is, run where the defender isn't. If it's zone, pull up underneath. If it's man-to-man, -man, go the distance. Back to pass is Moon, looking deep for Tony Jones! Toast! Oh, oh baby, baby, what a toast. throw! Tony Jones, 30, 20, he's gonna score! The run and shoot employs four receivers that stretch the defense. One receiver occupies the underneath coverage, keeping linebackers from getting a deep drop in the secondary. This gives the passer an unobstructed path to another receiver in the same zone. It's an offense based on pattern precision. The cut is very, very important because we do a lot of speed cuts here, and uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, you don't need to do speed cuts if that's bad, but we do a lot of speed turns and we just get to the open spot. We have to be on the same page as the quarterback and then run and shoot style of offense. Okay, if we get blitz, everybody break their route off, all right? And uh, if you're not, you know, he can throw an interception, you can make a bad read, and it makes like, you know, neither one of you know what you're doing. Receivers are required to read coverages and alter routes. One wrong turn can spell disaster. A lot of times the coaches don't know, pretty much know what Warren is doing out there, because Warren changes a lot of plays in the huddle, you know. Watch that back of Ryan, you know. Sorry, don't get too wide on this 81X curl special, you're in the flat, right? There's certain routes that I might ask, uh, say Haywood on a certain option on that he might have. Hook, they gave us two zones, so be ready to settle down out there on the sideline. Instead of giving him the option, I'm just going to tell him to do exactly what I want him to do. Sometimes the adjustment was applied immediately. Okay, now if I throw the hitch, I might throw it outside. Yeah. When you come, when, when you hitch, the ball might be out there. Yeah. Okay. Other times, it took a week. Boone with plenty of time. Down the far side, Duncan yeah. touchdown! You know, we try and stay to the basics, but we have a pretty good communication now to where we can do those types of things and get away with them. For the last five years, Moon has led the Oilers to the playoffs, but in 1992, he'll turn 36. The question is, um, how, how much does Warren Moon have left? At the age when most quarterbacks put their pads away, the Oilers are counting on Moon to pass them into the postseason one more time. The Houston Oilers of the late 1970s never got their moment in the sun. They lived in the shadow of the great Steeler dynasty and were always second best. Recently, the Love Ya Blue Oilers had a reunion and celebrated all the old times. Now, why would a team that never even won its division want to relive all those frustrating years? Well, if you were part of that team, you'd know why. If you weren't, you'd never understand. Houston, Texas was riding high in the late 70s. Big Daddy Oil had turned the city into a boom town, and it had a football team of Oilers to match. Houston called this run of good fortune, Love Your Blue, and flush with success, focused all of its civic pride on the local 11. goes to Earl Campbell. Breaks the tackle at the 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. At the 50, he breaks right up. At the 10, at the 5, touchdown. Houstonians had always felt inferior to those hot shots up the road in Dallas. But now they had a homegrown Texas hero named Bum Phillips to lead them to the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, in the 70s, that road led through Pittsburgh. The warmth of Love Ya Blue died from exposure in this riverfront ice house with all its terrible towels. In 78 and 79, the Oilers suffered through two consecutive losses in the AFC Championship game against the Steelers. In the second, Dan Pastorini threw to Mike Renfro for what appeared to be a game-tying touchdown late in the third quarter. It was a moment in time that decided the Oilers' fate as the call went against them and Pittsburgh went on to Super Bowl glory while the Oilers went home losers. But back in Houston, they found a scene that put the Super Bowl to shame. After both losses, 
More than 50,000 fans packed the Astrodome to welcome home their fallen heroes. I can't say anything. What like tears come to my eyes, I'm telling you. They've been here for hours and I hours. I can't believe it. But I've never seen anything like it in my life. I just wish we could have won for them. God knows we tried, and uh, it's just great. It really is. More than a decade later, Bum and his boys returned to Houston for a Love Ya Blue reunion. Boom days were over, but thousands of fans still felt the loyalty that cut both ways. Thank y'all for coming out. We meant everything we said about loving y'all. Only in Houston, Texas, can you, can you find something like this. That two times that we were in the dome and then coming back to Day's Eve, you don't, your kids don't mind you either, huh, Ronnie? <laughs> We were thinking about having a, a little scrimmage, offense against defense. We were thinking about that, and we thought how convenient it would be because we wouldn't need slow motion instant replay. They would already be going in slow motion. In the old days, slow motion pointed out the power of these boys of autumn. The oiler cannonball Earl Campbell was a one-man wrecking crew headed for the Hall of Fame. But the rest of the team was made up of underdogs and overachievers, just like the town they represented. Billy White Shoes Johnson was a 15th round draft pick. Tony Frisch came from Austria to kick a touchdown. And Carl Mock was the team sergeant at arms and balladeer. From the fancy passing day go to the Tyler Bowling Ball. Those Steelers can be taken by the Oiler Cannonball. Yeah. Ah. Damn it, let's go here. Hey. Switch, switch. Don't ah. run sideways, hit it up in there. Go, Bubba, go. He scored. He scored. He scored. All the Oilers had a common trait. They were characters with character. Took it away from them. People are special to me, like my own children. And I've got a bunch of children, but, but these people are like my own children. The thing about it is, we was a family. And nobody could ever break that up. Back in those days, Bum's family got together off the field as well to eat pizza, drink beer, and develop a closeness that was rare at the pro level. On Saturdays during the season, Bum declared Family Day, turning over the practice field to the players' kids and dogs with a little homespun advice. Watch out till you get the dog bit. Hey! On Sundays, the old man got serious. That's three holding penalties on one football team and a quarter and a half. That ain't funny. You know what we got to do? We got to go out there, and every man got to do his job. Every man got to pull together, and every man got to be able to overcome adversity. Don't care what it is. Don't care what happens. We've done it all year long. We hadn't let go of that rope, and we're not going to start right now. Let's go get this. It was a perfect match of time and place, town and team. Two losses to Pittsburgh couldn't change what they shared. I tell you, time has a way of changing a whole lot of things and changing a lot of us. It can take your youth away and your car and maybe your house in some cases, but it can't take your memories. You can believe me, this is a memorable time. This bunch back together was worth living 67 years to see. And no matter what we lose, they can never take this away. And they can't take it away from the city. We gave them something, and we took something from them.